So, what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is um, kind of a collection of thoughts uh, that started the last few years that have kind of rolled forward as, as the sort of work, you know, Peter described the things that I do. It's actually more and more difficult to kind of encapsulate the things that I do uh, in a single definition. But um, a lot of the research that I've been working on both outside of consulting projects and for clients um, has uh, kind of begins to snowball and build a life of its own over time. Uh, and one thing I've learned in the past 20 years is once you have a kind of nice snowball working, you begin to pull it together, call it a research project, and cast it off for a little bit of a life of its own. And so I want to talk to you a little bit today about uh, kind of critical thoughts about the IoT, about the Internet of Things, uh, and uh, a little kind of sneak preview of a project that's just kicking off uh, to do a little bit with that. So um, the, the kind of talk is about something I'm calling Things Clash uh, that I'll describe a little bit more in just a second. But it's basically about putting human values back in the Internet of Things. Um, if you've been to the UK in the past few years, uh, first of all, you may not want to go back um, after the last few days, but if you do, if you're brave enough uh, and you do go back um, and you use the tube, you'll probably have seen a sign like this before and, and if you're listening out, you might have heard some warnings. Uh, warning both people who live there and tourists, visitors, business people using the tube to beware of something called card clash. Um, and the first time I heard it, you know, I sort of spit take, stop, what? You know, what is it you're warning me about, among other things? You know, being, constantly being warned about things. Uh, telling us to watch out for card clash. And card clash is um, a term that was invented, uh, created, I guess, by Transport for London to talk about what happens when um, two new things that you didn't know you probably had, or you may have known you had, but didn't know that they were not going to agree with each other, come together uh, in your pocket, your briefcase, your wallet, your hand, somewhere in your kind of proximate environment. Uh, and begin to start a fight not only with each other, but also with the, the sort of systems and infrastructure of the transport uh, network. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with it, card clash is essentially what happens when you take a transport card, which when I ripped my wallet, I realized I had, for better or worse, as a kind of story of my life, uh, three different conflicting uh, chip cards that are contactless cards used for different transport networks. My Oyster card is somewhere else right now, Maybe someone's having a free ride on it in London. Uh, I don't care. Um, this is my chip card for Amsterdam. Also have uh, an NFC card. Uh, this is an American credit card with NFC, which is kind of a rare thing right now. Um, a chip card, debit card. Uh, if you mug me later, you can get a lot off of me. Um, and also, you know, like most of us now, carrying a smartphone that has uh, embedded NFC reader in it with multiple apps that are frequently making calls on the NFC. Uh, and you basically have all of these little radio devices and chips in your, you know, in your kind of personal environment that are conflicting with each other, arguing about um, who gets precedence. I know on a technical level that's probably partly worked out, but card clash is basically where these systems come together and say, no, me first, no, me first, which one do you want to use? Um, and it struck me that this is something kind of unusual, um, that we were basically being warned about the downsides of essentially a new capability, a new system, uh, where you would have the convenience of touchless entry and exit into the metro system, into the subway system, on buses, etc. Uh, you would have the touchless convenience of a, a, a chip credit card, a chip debit card, cash point card, and yet the two conveniences, when put together, actually create a clash. And it seems like this is kind of, uh, you know, a statement on modern society today. Here's this wonderful new thing that you've got. Here's the future. Take it. And yet, um, you can't take it too far because you might run into an issue. So then we have a kind of secondary uh, industry spring up of things like uh, wallets that are designed to keep card clash from happening, to keep these cards apart. Um, those of you with a technical background in this area will probably know the, the sort of uh, tolerances and variations and how far those two chips need to be kept apart um, when l using an NFC reader like uh, an Oyster card reader. And of course, if you, you know, look at something like uh, Berg's famous video uh, showing the, the visual outlines of, a, of an Oyster card reader, you'll see what those radio environments look like. Um, but we now have a kind of secondary market. This is off of, um, I think, Alibaba, uh, selling wallets that are specially designed to keep your chips apart and to keep card clash from happening, and essentially probably to keep this emerging new thing of uh, thing clash from happening. 
being a paranoid race, Americans are beginning to buy RFID shielding little Faraday wallets uh, in increasing numbers, and you find them now when you walk into retail stores, you know, sitting at the front checkout counter. Um, of course, there's a great worry for us about people scanning our passports. Now that those have uh, RFID chips in them, uh, and this isn't just kind of something that's relegated to, to or sort of restricted to the area of, um, of uh, radio chips. Apparently, butt scanning is a problem. No, uh, I just found this graphic and needed to use it. Um, but the idea, that, and, and again, this is a particular kind of American issue, I think, uh, this concern that someone's always out there basically tr pointing readers at us and trying to steal our money, steal our identity, God knows what else they might steal from us. Um, as Dr. Strangelove said, our precious bodily fluids um, but uh, this, these, you're starting to kind of see more and more of these, of these symbols show up in the environment around us. Um, you know, the Berlin Metro is a great example. You walk onto the trains and you see all of these yellow stickers. You're under surveillance. There's a camera here. Don't use this. Don't do that. You know, watch what you've got. Careful what you use. Don't turn this up. Turn this down. And this is kind of a crazy situation if you think about it. You know, we're promised this kind of seamless, beautiful future. Tina was talking yesterday about the seamlessness of the IoT and the sort of the, the smooth environment that you want. Uh, and you want things to kind of happen in a naturalistic fashion. And yet, um, like, you know, our mothers coming along behind us saying, don't do that, don't touch this. Um, we're now beginning to see not only these new conveniences emerge, but different warnings uh, appear in different places. So, um, the more new product categories that are introduced and the more new experiences that are created, uh, the, the kind of weirder and stranger this becomes. So uh, on the upper left, I'm just thinking about all of the different kinds of technologies um, that are kind of being presented to us, and each one actually kind of poses a different challenge. Uh, no sooner had Google Glass been released into the environment than Google Glass Panic was released into the environment. And you begin to see, and probably as a good PR exercise, bars and restaurants, clubs and gyms, schools, etc., putting up signs that say, that's fantastic, but please don't do it here. And this, of course, happened with the advent of the camera phone if you were uh, uh, using a gym or a fitness center, for example. You, know, you begin to see signs that say, please don't bring that camera into um, the locker room environment for obvious reasons or in obvious reasons. Um, but we have these signs like on the upper, upper side talking about, you know, removing your glasses. Um, you know, you see something as nice and sort of polite as this sign, kindly remove before entering, or kindly, yeah, kindly remove before entering. But you also have signs that basically say, you know, absolutely not, no robots here, cyborgs not welcome, not going to do it here. Um, you have states, for example, that are making, you know, creating legislation to encourage things like self-driving cars or new technologies new chipless technologies, et cetera, to come in, but you also have those that are considering legislation to keep them out. And at a kind of big civic meta level, this is a sort of thing clash. Um, you have a, a, a tension between what the technology can do, the benefits that it can provide, uh, and also social, technological, political, um, business model, economic pushback uh, as to, to uh, what models and systems and cultures that's rubbing against. So, so glass is a kind of, we'll take that as a kind of privacy uh, thing clash. And we'll put that in sort of one category over here. Now we have something like the Apple smartwatch, which is new and different than other smartwatches, uh, in part because it can cost $15,000. And I'm sure it has a lot of amazing features. I've seen them kind of popping up in public. I think I've seen at least one or two here on people's wrists. But um, aside from a sort of technology issue, and there is a kind of new glitch that I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, this emerged around an Apple Watch. Don't worry, you don't have to, to take it off and run screaming. Um, but the idea that you would be charging $15,000 for a piece of technology like this is essentially setting a kind of economic thing clash in place, uh, creating a certain barrier that says, um, here's some technology, it does amazing things just like these other products. Uh, but it's essentially kind of set out of reach and, and made only accessible for a certain economic group. So it's not just a kind of technology conflict, but you also have economic conflict. Um, some of you, if you recognize this kind of screen behind me, this is spreadsheets, uh, which if you didn't know, you'll have to uh, wash your ears out now. This is a, a, an app designed to uh, quantify your sex life. And uh, you can see just from the kind of bottom of the screen there that it's already kind of picked out certain metrics, 
certain critical KPIs uh, that need to be tracked uh, in the you know, act of, I would say, well, I don't know what the right term is. Yes, um, enjoying yourself or enjoying yourself with others or enjoying someone else or enjoying a large group of other people. But if you've looked at apps like this, um, they probably, if the chances are, if you, I don't know if you have looked at apps like this, but chances are they are uh, coming from a particular kind of mindset, a particular model of sex, a particular point of view of who should be involved and what activities they should be engaged in, because that's what it measures, right? Measurement is management. Um, so in this case, uh, I, it's assuming certain kind of KPIs for sexual activity I think if you kind of dig a little bit deeper, it's probably also assuming a, a kind of not just heteronormativity, but a certain user experience, uh, particular sort of ways of using things, particular ways of organizing yourselves. Uh, and there may be, you know, there's probably a premium level where you have to add new users. I don't know. Um, and the other corner here, this is an example that I've come back to a few times lately because it's still kind of makes me stop and wonder. This is a Withings home camera that was introduced last year. Uh, it's just a wireless um, home monitoring camera that can be connected to your smart home system if you have such. Uh, it will capture live video and back it up to the cloud, uh, if you like, of things that are going on in your home. Uh, and of course, this is kind of pitched as other things, drop cam, et cetera, as kind of home security, home safety technologies. But this one actually comes with a couple of interesting new sensors uh, involved. One is it's got capability of, of listening as well. And if you look at some of the original marketing material, it describes it as being designed to capture uh, the sound of a cry. Uh, and so if it hears someone crying and sees it on video, it, it will kind of flag you to that. Uh, and also it has, a, I believe, this version has a kind of scent sensor to detect certain chemical off-gassing uh, in the environment around it. I think, the, again, the original intent was for family safety, child safety. If your you know, child's in one room and you're in another, assuming you have a child, because now we're already making assumptions about family structure. Assuming you have a child, <coughs> and that child is, is crying or hurt or unhappy, you'll know about it uh, through this kind of sensory network, and also it might tell you if you've got radon gas in the house, um, again, another one of those weird American obsessions, or if there's CO2 uh, build up because of a leaking fireplace or gas connection, et cetera. But you can also imagine many, many different scenarios in which a camera might catch something crying in a strange smell and or in the same environment. So um, do we think about the context, the various contexts in which something like crying happens? Um, do we um, have consent to capture what's being packaged as or presented as emotional data? What are the reporting requirements? Who has chain of custody of this data? What could be going on in this particular house? Um, what are the kind of local legislations around something like, let's say, domestic abuse? Um, what you're catching on camera, how is that reported? Uh, who owns that data? Whose information is it anyway? If you're making a connected vibrator, are you thinking differently about sexual health? Are you taking a particularly normal model, normal model of what that may be like and sort of certain people's needs? Um, Georgina, who spoke yesterday, has done some great work in the past year around um, technologies and sexual health and issues of privacy, and she talked about stigma yesterday. All of those things are kind of wrapped in here. Um, what are the terms of service for something like that? How do you even begin to specify it? Uh, and then lastly, this is a, a, a thing that was introduced around CES of this year. It's a connected bed for kids. And the idea is this smart bed will, of course, again, like the camera, report to parents um, you know, what sort of activities are going on in their child's bed. That, exactly. Um, you're not the first one to think that. Uh, there's a little URL here at the bottom. Uh, some colleagues and I wrote a piece at the beginning of this year. Actually, it was kind of a captured conversation, uh, discussion transcribed around this topic because rather than just kind of tweet quickly, no, um, nope. Uh, just, we decided to actually kind of get some people together and talk about this. What actually happens when um, you uh, could wire up your children's bed and, and know what kind of activities are going on there. Um, so this was myself, Natalie Kane, um, Susan Cox-Smith, Kristen Alford, uh, and Madeline Ashby kind of having this conversation from a number of different perspectives, some of us parents, some not. And Madeline's first uh, conclusion was um, there are probably activities happening in that bed that you may or may not expect to find reported out to you, uh, or you may not want to have reported out to you. And if you have teenage children, you can see the problems it's introduced by um, throwing a connected bed into the household. So, um, 
we could kind of you know, take more and more different products and services and look at them, but we kind of begin to break this down and categorize it. You know, we have simple things like a clash of ecosystems. If you're wearing, say, a Samsung wearable um, that you've purchased, you'll probably find out that not only is it restricted to Android, uh, but it may also only work with Samsung hardware and software and services. This is not a new thing. This is how the technology industry works. It's called ecosystem lock-in. Um, you, are, you are brought into a stack for maximization of revenue. Um, this is how you design business plans. It makes complete sense from a rational point of view, but from a human point of view, thinking about you know, what I want to work with what in my world, these things start to kind of bump into each other. Um, it does, the, the sunk costs of your ecosystem, otherwise known as your stuff, um, prohibit you from making choices and putting this technology together in a way that makes sense. Um, maybe you have an operating system mismatch. Maybe you didn't want to update it. And then, you know, you have other categories. So, th you know, those are things that happen with wearables. If you're wearing a device, you're probably going to be moving around in the world and it's going to be interacting with a lot of different situations. But let's say you've got um, a new product in the house that uh, can listen, like the camera or like uh, Amazon Echo or Samsung Smart TV or, you know, many of these beautiful new things Remote controls, of course, um, some later versions of Android, your device is basically has the option to switch on and listen all the time. Your voice is basically buffered, uh, sent to a server and stored there, whether or not it's actually a command that you're issuing. Um, but you can think of a lot of different situations where you might want to have a conversation with someone, your partner, for example, your partner that um, you've introduced to your family, your partner perhaps you haven't introduced to your family. Uh, perhaps you don't have a family. But you can think of a lot of different intimate conversations you might be having that you probably don't want something listening to. So we have a kind of um, privacy thing clash, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. It has, again, to do with things like consent, context, lots of different complications that creep in here. Um, you may ha be in an environment where you aren't fully aware that there are not one but many sensors out there in the environment around you, things like the beacons displayed here that are creating lots of different clashes. Um, you don't know what functions are built into those. You're stepping into a public environment that you believe to be safe and friendly, um, but you may or may not, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, have any kind of notification of data collection, calls on the devices that you're wearing or carrying, et cetera. And now that we have things like these lovely smart cars and, and autonomous driving, self-driving vehicles and semi-self-driving vehicles, and who knows what else, um, there are not just, again, kind of technical ecosystem issues that we face, but when you think about something like automotive culture, like driving, it's a deeply uh, embedded activity in modern uh, culture today around the world. Uh, every country has its own driving laws. Every state in the U.S. has its own driving laws. You have different jurisdictions, different tolerances, different social tolerances, different um, kind of... Um, momentary views of the public, a zeitgeist, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and so again, even in the states, we're sort of facing a situation where you have 50 states who could regulate something like self-driving cars 50 different ways, but if you're out on the street and you're encountering one, um, you have a kind of potential, not just a technical clash, but um, you, your, your patterns of driving, the way that you observe the world around you, how you react and respond, your needs and tastes and habits of driving uh, could be conflicting with the technical system that's now been introduced into the world around you. And um, this kind of starts at the top. Uh, if you take something like culture and Google culture and Internet of Things, uh, the first things that really come up for the first few pages are largely corporations, Cisco's, IBM's, etc., talking about how they have an amazing culture that allows them to be innovative around the IoT but I don't think they're actually talking about your culture and my culture, whatever that may be, or any of our many, many, many subcultures that we participate in on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. They're taking a word like culture and appropriating it to mean something that's internal to the business itself, um, but they're basically just reflecting an internal worldview. We have a ping pong table, we have some cushy bag, uh, bean bags. Um, this is our culture, uh, and we're going to use it to deliver technology to you, and you can worry about how that fits into your culture. But what about building a culture that mirrors society, both from the inside of the business, but also within the business models themselves, the user experience, and on down the line? Um, or just say openly that it doesn't matter. 
uh, that you're going to produce products that you don't necessarily mind whether they fit uh, within the many different cultures that a user experiences. Uh, and that you as an organization only reflect the customers that you want. That's also a choice. Um, and you know, one of the kind of things that we're approaching at this, at this you know, juncture in the development of the Internet of Things uh, is that we're experiencing a, you know, waves of products that are designed not for us, but at us. Um, that they are basically designed at us as manipulative assistants that are working us for information. Uh, not, all, not all IoT products and services, but many that you, you can sort of think of in a fairly short list. Um, are the, the, the kind of business model is essentially designed to work you for data because the data, not the single product cells, not the razor blade, it's, I mean not the razor, but it's the, the, the data is the razor blade here in the classic uh, example. Um, the, the behaviors and the, the, the usage, the functions, the behaviors, all of the things that extend out from that central piece of technology and the functions that, it, that are embedded within it uh, begin to be turned, again, not around the kind of um, culture that you bring to the transaction, uh, but around the culture that can drive more transactions to uh, create more monetization around data. Measurement is management, but management by whom? By you as the user, by you as the individual, by the cultures that you're steeped in, or by something that's actually imposed on you. What is user experience here? What is the actual experience? If it's defined as usability alone, just as an enjoyment of a new experience that someone else has thought up, or how a new device or service or regime extends or replaces, what is it clashing with? And what are your actual needs? And then what happens uh, when your system, or uh, to your culture, when your system uh, sunsets? Uh, Bruce, I think, pointed to a couple of examples here recently. Tobias Revel has uh, collected a few in Tumblr of what happens when IoT systems are sunsetted. They're either sold off, um, they're not profitable and brought to an end. These new behaviors and new sort of cultures that have been put on people uh, can potentially disappear with them. So you take the experience, the behavior, the incentives, the learning, all of that kind of goes away with it. Uh, a little bit further down the road, we have to start thinking about what, where the IoT essentially extends to uh, and the example that was given recently of a gentleman who had a, a robotic arm, a prosthesis developed by a particular company that allowed him to actually have use of, a, of an arm that had, he had lost uh, due to a medical uh, issue. Um, the company that operated and developed that arm uh, decided to go out of business because it wasn't profitable anymore. Um, he's kind of back where he started, only with a, a fairly useless piece of metal. Maybe he can find a maker community somewhere who can help him out. Uh, some open source code, but you can, th you can begin to see the, the, the extent to which um, these kinds of business decisions can have an impact on people. What happens beyond the confines of the, of the next kind of generation of the product roadmap? So I kind of bang on culture because I think it's a really critical issue here and it's the key to understanding where these different clashes take place around the Internet of Things. Business models shape behavior. Behavior becomes culture. Um, culture is then encoded by the optimal data reporting intervals of a toothbrush, a thermostat, or a vibrator. Uh, or all three on a bad day, or a good day. If you can get those working together, that's why we have things like IFT. Um, but these values that we understand and we implement into smart things are, are now what we're encoding, not just into our own temporary experiments or something we're showing as a demo to friends, investors, colleagues, etc. But you're essentially laying down layers of sediment for future generations. You're establishing legacy code and legacy behaviors and legacy features and functions and business models that, that get extended down the road further and further. If you think about things like, you know, Windows BIOS and how old some of the kind of core code can be uh, in a release of Windows, you begin to understand that you're talking about 20 years of time can go by where functional decisions that are made here uh, can actually begin to dictate entire cultures of work uh, and productivity down the road. And this, of course, is just in the world of desktop uh, software. When we talk about the Internet of Things, you're all telling me that we're talking about us and we're talking about our world. Um, so we're encoding these things for future generations and the values that we're socializing next generations of people up to are what are being put in here today. Um, in Bruce's recent book, Epic Battle for the Internet of Things, he has this great line, the in the Internet of Things world, people chew less gum. Uh, and you think about that, something like, you know, chewing gum, bubble gum, a, a simple 
kind of pleasure or perhaps it's a way of working off personal tension or a way of concentrating or focusing. These sort of unknown and, and almost hidden and invisible acts uh, and, and pleasures and behaviors that we have um, can be substituted out overnight. You think about something like um, societies or cities or city states where um, you don't have chewing gum, where it's not allowed because we need to keep the streets clean and the system hygienic. Uh, these also may, ha may happen to be places where there are extensive smart city projects and Internet of Things projects going on. So these little subtle changes and sort of removal of things from our basic cultural ecosystem, like a piece of chewing gum, um, that gets substituted out by the ability to constantly work your tension off on a smartphone uh, have potentially profound uh, impacts. And think about these cultural touchstones later in life. You know, what, what are the sort of seminal moments that in, in culture? Um, at the risk of sounding like an old person shaking my fist uh, at the sky, I was thinking recently about things like films, classic movies, and how would they have been different if you introduced the, the sort of current world of the Internet of Things? If you've seen American Graffiti, one of the original Spielberg films uh, built around uh, you know, a, a group of American teenagers in the 1950s racing hot rods, or say Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean, what would that have been like with automatic uh, plugged into the car? Um, restricting speed limits, um, reporting information about location, driving behavior, et cetera, James Dean probably would have just sat there in his car and kind of gone, nah, we'll race another time in another jurisdiction. Um, Think about the classic Ingr uh, Ingrid Bergman movie, Gaslight, uh, but with Nest, and the ability of uh, her husband, uh, no spoilers, sorry, but uh, to um, kind of make her think different things simply based on manipulation of the in-house uh, heating and air conditioning system. Uh, what would the march on Selma have been like with Fitbit? Would it have happened? Would everyone have stayed together? Don't know. Um, and so we kind of reach this you know, dystopic point of thinking about, uh, am I going to look in my rearview mirror one day and find that I'm being followed down the street by not only a self-driving car, but a self-owned self-driving car that is kind of nagging me to take out a high interest rate uh, a temporary loan to purchase it and drive it. Um, these are the kind of ways that you know, culture can kind of become delaminated and separated from the rest of our lives. So, um, so we started working on this idea of thing clash just briefly here to conclude. Um, after a deep dive research project last year, looking at the IoT and data, not just proprietary stacks, but different areas, and not just the current generation of new release, but the legacy of design and UX decisions and promises made by a business model and so on. And the idea here is that we'll create um, essentially a framework, uh, a, a, a not perhaps simple uh, and reductive, but a, a manageable way of beginning to investigate and understand uh, and categorize these different cross points what are the cross impacts and implications of colliding technologies? Can we find a way to surface and make legible the tensions and the frictions and the conflicts that arise when new connected data collecting objects are introduced into our world? Just where does thing clash happen? I've kind of given you a, a bunch of examples as a list, but that's just a rant. Um, how can we begin to kind of categorize, collect, and, and take these things apart a little bit and understand what happens when we introduce thing A into culture B um, where are the benefits, but also where are the downsides? Uh, you know, how could we avoid this? What are the kind of deeper level legacy issues that are buried underneath there that we may need to untie or un undo? Um, we might find some simple tools and ways of doing this, something really lightweight and easy, um, because apparently uh, in-depth and detailed isn't breaking through uh, in the current world, and so we might have to find simple ways to get together around a table and simply play a game of snaps and figure out, um, you know, does your thing fit in my world? Does my thing fit in your world? What are the complications? Um, and one of the kind of conflicts here is that, you know, corporate IoT developers, big, the biggest companies, the big brands, have the resources to engage in aligning IoT with culture, but they have the strongest incentives and pressures not to do so. Um, they have the strongest incentives to kind of meet the next quarterly results uh, and not to deploy these uh, capabilities. Um, you have small indie IoT uh, groups and organizations, many of you here in the room, who have the greatest driver, the, probably the greatest desire internally to align with culture, but have the least resources and the highest risk involved in doing so. So we're trying to find a way to make that easy for everybody. Um, how can we develop tools to anticipate thing clash, imagine different situations and scenarios where devices, services, people, systems, cultures, situations all face friction? 
Um, there's a little bit of, of, uh, of material up online right now. There's a Twitter address that's live. Uh, we're going to start collecting basic different critical perspectives on the IoT to put them out there, just to stimulate thought. Uh, and we'd love to, to talk with and collaborate with different groups and individuals to think about how uh, we can make this uh, something easy, easier to deal with and easier to think about. Um, I'm not against the Internet of Things. I, I, have, I do, after 20-something years of working in technology field, uh, have a, a kind of interest and love for what happens next and what's possible. But I also have grown tired over these decades of seeing wave after wave after wave kind of crash into the wall uh, and create little car accidents and train wrecks here and there throughout the culture we live in. It's, it's a shift in technology that will, in some shape or form, pervade the world. It's not just sensors, not just apps and gadgets uh, that can help, help us lead optimized, actualized lives, more convenient, seamless, fitter, happier, more productive, as the robot says. Um, but these are also systems that are embedded in much of our built and used environment. Uh, everything that we use, everything we touch, has the potential to, to be home to some of these systems. And they'll be running on increasingly complex, increasingly autonomous, and expert systems designed to make independent decisions. Um, these are systems that will be responsible for keeping us company as we slip towards the end of life. These are systems and devices that will actually help us die, probably, those of us in this generation. Now's the time to actually consider where these clashes exist. Uh, and if nothing else convinces you, that might. And the thought of your, your last moments um, looking at a blinking sensor on the wall and going, damn it, <laughs> why can't you just bring me that thing? Um, you know, as we, as we uh, kind of go towards this era, we need to be thinking about where these clashes exist, how can we avoid them potentially, um, or minimize them, as we bring these new things into being. Um, this is a struggle to tame things and make them behave according to our cultural understanding and not the other way around. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll have time for a couple of questions, um, but I have a couple of questions for okay. you uh, before. <laughs> for, first of all, just to give, you an uh, to give us an impression, if I walked into your apartment right now, what kind of connected stuff is there, and what do the clashes look like on the day-to-day? -day? If, if you walked into my house. Yeah, because I'm just asking, because I live <laughs> in Berlin, and yeah. infrastructure here is stuck in the deep end of the 20th century. There is nothing smart about most houses here. Right, well, I, and I live in a, in a, you know, what's essentially kind of middle American, slightly off the grid uh, kind of environment. I think I have 26 or 27 MAC addresses at last count on the two uh, subnets in my house. Uh, but again, most of it is just simple stuff like uh, an iPad and a MacBook, um, the various smartphones, etc. But we actually haven't gone down the road of bringing more kind of wearables into the house, partly because of just behavioral clashes, people not really wanting to use it or desiring that function um, or just we can't really get it to work. I don't have access uh, at certain levels of the network that I want to, to fix it. So it's often keeping it simple just to avoid the, the hassle. Yeah, I mean, this connects right back to the IoT manifesto we discussed last night a little bit. There was yeah. one point in the end we're all human beings. And I love Tom Coates' reply to that, who also, as you know, like builds stuff in that field. And he's like, yes, we're all just human beings, even the things, particularly the things <laughs> Well, that's one way of looking at it. But I mean, if you, you know, it, like, I spend a lot of time in kind of R&D environments and, and seeing, you know, what, what sort of the next kind of generations of things that are possible, but also go back into the real world and see regular behaviors that fail over time. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of taking those things into account and figuring out how can these two pieces work together so we don't end up with the pile of e-waste that Tina talked about yesterday and all the broken screens and circuitry, but it actually is something usable. And you mentioned that the key uh, to all this is basically the, the cultural part. How can we in this room, is there anything we can do in this room to kind of steer that culture a little bit and nudge it to the right direction? Make friends of a sociologist. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, this is, this is an issue like small organizations, small companies don't have, you know, resident ethnographers and anthropologists that are involved. I think, you know, maybe we need a human terrain team of, uh, you know, technology anthropologists and ethnographers and social scientists who can you know, team together, think about these things, create a kind of open framework for other people to understand them, and then push that out, because otherwise, you know, it's going to be difficult on a case-by-case -case basis. All right. Let's open up for questions. There is a microphone somewhere in the back. If you could just raise your hands. 
Thanks. This is uh, this is great. Is is Thing Clash going to be? Um, I, I wasn't one hundred percent sure what what it what it's going to be, but are we going to be able to, uh, you know, uh, leave examples and start creating a database of where a Thing Clash is happening for me, for other people? Where Potentially, I, I think part of it is to start a conversation and create a common a common communication point. Um, we are working on a couple of initial sort of simple tool sets uh, to begin to, to work with the basics. But I think, you know, not only just us putting out a list of interesting resources and, and you know, things to think about, but also information kind of coming back in as well uh, so that it's collaborative and not just a completely proprietary, um, you know, consulting project to put it out there. So, yes, in a way. So, so to elaborate on that a little bit, is there is on a scale of um, uh, social research project to, like, RFC standards organization to to try to make things um, you know specify standards to avoid clashes between chip cards. Where uh, is all of that? Are we doing the whole? whole I can imagine getting into the latter conversation eventually, but I don't. I don't. I mean, we're not a kind of standards group setting out okay. to, to sort of create you know NFC interoperability. No, right, right. So no. This gonna... is this is that's something that other people struggle with on a day to day basis. This is basically saying. Um, and it's essentially an exercise in opening our eyes to what's already going on around us and beginning to sort of pinpoint and say, this is, you know, this is a place where friction is happening. This is a place where friction is happening. Why is that going on? And are there simple ways to kind of break that down and think about it and, right. and play that forward in different scenarios? So probably lean it a bit more towards the, the research side. Um, and uh, yeah. Great. Can't wait. Thanks. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, there's this disconnect between incentives on the manufacturers, the big, uh, big names, uh, in terms of aligning uh, things with our, our cultures. Do you, have you thought of, uh, or do you, do you have any ideas how we can uh, change and augment uh, the, uh, the playing field so that these big manufacturers start thinking about it, start acting, or is it, does it boil down to just uh, creating legal whips to, um, put them in and, and put that in perspective? Well, I think it's, um, I mean, you know, for example, some of the, the earlier devices, you know, something just as simple as like, the, you know, Fitbit design and the, the, you know, rubber, I think it was, that was kind of irritating people's skin or the nickel plating or whatever it was. Um, you know, you have, you starting to kind of, of course, because of the internet, it's a two-way channel, you have ability of the actual users to have a voice uh, and specify that. But I think part of it's just giving people the language to articulate these issues. It's finding the resources and, uh, you know, professionals or academics or whomever is, is out there to bring those kind of social and user research skills to, to bear uh, in helping to solve some of those issues because some companies just aren't aware that that's actually an issue. Um, when you go into startup land, uh, you know, in the valley or elsewhere, somebody doesn't kind of tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, dude, hey, bro, there's probably some, you know, humans out there this might actually affect or impact. You know, the focus is, is quite narrow on, uh, you know, getting a product and getting an exit. In some cases, not everybody. Um, so I think part of it's just introducing the language into it and then also kind of making people aware that there are other resources out there. You take someone like, or a company like Intel, for example, um, I think of it not because it's, you know, supporting this event, but because I, a couple of weeks ago, had the opportunity to spend time with uh, Genevieve Bell, who, if you don't know her, is the uh, VP of Research at Intel and an amazing um, anthropologist in, in the field of technology uh, and has a, a fantastic team that she's working with to do this kind of work that under, underpins a lot of these technologies. Um, you know, being aware of their work and understanding kind of what they're doing and how they're approaching it, I think, is one way of breaking through some of the problem. Hey there, a great talk. Um, I'm Thank based you. in the Bay Area and I got to see the sort of rise and fall of the Google Glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, one contribution to, to culture was all the jokes that people would crack like a segue for your head. Right. Um, but <laughs> what was great about that whole project was it had consequences for, for Google. Like they basically screwed up and they had to shut the project down. And so, you know, what are the consequences for the Oyster card people? Like if people, I, I don't think you can pre-think all the uh, potential you know, ramifications of a connected device. It's very, very hard to predict all the combinatorics, but 
if you know that you're going to get your asses kicked and get <laughs> shut down if you screw up, that can be sobering. And I'm wondering, is, is there any part of your um, work that's about how to make it much clearer to people and empower organizations to further to be consequences to, make, to the making these mistakes so that we don't have to just live with these errors and actually, you know, that's where the bad effects would happen if we right. had to live with the mistakes. Well, I mean, some of it is, is in the magical experience of strategic foresight. Uh, it's just, it's, it's having some basic tools and methods that allow you to sit down with a piece of paper and sort of say, let's think of not only the first level, but second and perhaps third level, you know, implications of some simple decisions. This is not, to use the hackneyed phrase, rocket science. It's, mm -hmm. it's taking the time to, uh, and in some cases budget, but mostly the sort of time and the, the initiative and the kind of like, the, the cultural element to sit down and think about um, what are the possibilities. I'm pretty sure in a co conversation over a cup of coffee in a five minutes, um, some people from you know, Transport for London and Barclays could have figured out that they both have chip cards in your pocket and they're going to argue with each other uh, at the touch point. Um, there's a management cultural issue to sort of saying WTF, you know, exactly. um, people can work that out. That, that problem might have been solved differently in a different geography, in a different, a different situation. Uh, but something that simple, or things like glass, you know, let's, let's, let's roll this outside of our bubble uh, and take this into other places and take it out into the world and see what happens. I had an opportunity to spend one afternoon with about probably 150 people who were trying glass for the same, at the same time from the public uh, in, uh, on the East Coast last year. And it was amazing seeing that many people putting this thing on at one time and kind of stumbling around with it and trying to figure out what works. First problem was, was being demoed in a room that had serious echo issues, and so voice-activated uh, technology doesn't work when 150 people are saying, okay, Google, at the same time. Um, people chewing gum, messing up sort of bone conduction, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I only know what goes on in some of these situations in laboratories. I don't know what goes on in everyone's head, but it seems like you could uh, take some time uh, and be smart like Sami and uh, figure out where these sort of situations exist. Um, I forgot the Apple conflict that I was going to mention um, is uh, the watch is having problems detecting heart rate on tattoos because it's now using a sort of, you know, newer commercial process of, you know, flashing light uh, at skin to, to uh, detect heart rate. And if you have ink on your wrist, you don't have a heart. What can I say? So that's a simple thing where, you know, maybe somebody with a tattoo could have put on an Apple watch and gone, I'm dead. So on that death note, I will leave you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Thank you.